What do shotguns, snowballs, and silver bullets have to do with changing the world? Well, to understand that, first we have to understand social networks. Everyone knows that if you want an idea to spread, you just need to convince highly connected people, like influencers, celebrities, and professional athletes. So let's say you want the world to adopt veganism. All you gotta do is win over Lizzo and LeBron James, they'll spread it to all their fans, and boom, we've got a vegan world right? Well, this has been the dominant idea in marketing and social networks for quite some time, and it owes its popularity to a paper from 1973 that introduced the idea of weak ties. Weak ties are connections in your social network that you'd probably describe as casual acquaintances. Think your dentist, strangers who follow you on social media, or the barista at your favorite coffee shop. Those are contrasted with strong ties, like friends and family members who you trust, have deep connections with, and generally interact with more often. Now imagine you want a virus or a viral meme to spread as quickly as possible. What ties should you target? The answer is weak ties. Strong ties tend to be redundant and somewhat insular, since many of your close friends and family know your other close friends and family, meaning the virus will just bounce around to already infected people. That is, until it hits a weak tie, like the barista, where it can then spread to other clusters in the social network. So it appears that in trying to spread a social norm, all we have to do is focus on celebrities and influencers who have millions of weak ties, and they'll spread it faster than anyone. But as Professor Damon Santola points out in his book, Change, this only seems to apply to a specific type of contagion he calls a simple contagion. So a virus is a classic example of a simple contagion, but in the social realm it could include things like cute cat videos or some piece of hot celebrity gossip. This is what Kim's neck looked like on Instagram, and this is what it actually looked like in a TikTok video. Basically, simple contagions are catchy ideas and memes that spread quickly to everyone, but lack any lasting impact on what we think or how we live. But what it doesn't apply to is complex contagions. Complex contagions include things like significant behavior changes and new social norms that require more effort from the individuals in the social network. So, something like veganism, switching to a new social media platform, or hopping on the latest footwear trend. Put simply, complex contagions are contagions that people resist. In these cases, people need to receive reinforcement or social proof from multiple adopters to be convinced and for the new behavior to propagate. The more resistance there is to a new idea or behavior, the more social reinforcement is needed to persuade people to adopt it. Thus, the redundancy of strong ties is now a strength when considering complex contagions, even though it was a weakness when considering simple contagions. And so we have a network bias. All else being equal, our beliefs and behaviors can be shaped by the architecture and our location in that social network. So we've all got this really intuitive notion that if a network can spread out in lots of directions like a fireworks explosion, that's gonna be a really fast, really effective way for spreading something. But if a network is all kind of clustered together, kind of like a fishing net, that that's gonna be kind of slow and lumbering and much less efficient. I talk about some of the science experiments I've done studying whether the sort of fireworks pattern or the fishing net pattern is more effective for spreading change. And what's so striking is that the fireworks networks are really good for getting information out there to everybody, but it doesn't really trigger adoption. But if we look at the fishing net pattern, information spreads much more slowly because it goes to a lot of the same people. You get a lot of redundancy. But that redundancy is actually really effective for triggering change. The reinforcement provides essentially social confirmation that this idea, this product or technology is a good one. And as people adopt, they further add more social confirmation among their peers and neighbors and spread much more effectively through these fishing net patterns to larger and larger numbers of people. Okay, but how does this all relate to shotgun snowballs and silver bullets? Well, as with everything in life, we have finite resources. And to change the world, we need to direct those finite resources in the most effective ways possible. And shotgun, snowball, and silver bullet all describe strategies for the distribution of those resources. The shotgun strategy says that we should distribute our resources broadly in a social network. So we might pick 10 people who each occupy different parts of the network and evenly distribute our time, energy, whatever, to getting them on board. By contrast, the silver bullet strategy says we should focus all our resources on a few highly connected individuals. And because those individuals are so connected, beloved, and charismatic, their connections will naturally follow in their footsteps. Now the snowball strategy says to target tightly knit groups at the periphery of networks. People in the periphery have fewer but stronger social connections, and so social norms can incubate and reach a critical mass before they have to face off against the established norm at the center of the network. So which strategy works best? Well, for simple contagions, the first two strategies are both viable options. But for complex contagions, they aren't going to work as well. Why? Consider the shotgun strategy. Each individual change agent you target is surrounded by a cluster of non-adopters. Because of this, it's difficult for them to establish the legitimacy, safety, and social proof mentioned earlier to get people to make some sort of significant change. What's worse is that the change agents themselves are likely to eventually abandon the new social norm due to the countervailing peer pressure of the 
established norm. So my plan is to become a hunter and hunt deer and moose and these things myself. You know, we come from a family with a lot of hunters. So this is the journey and the path that I'm gonna take. Especially for me as an ethical vegan of five years, I think it's really important for me, for my personal journey, to hunt and kill these animals myself. In other words, if you spontaneously start wearing Guy Fieri shirts and all of your friends just look at you weird, don't give you any compliments, and don't start wearing the shirts themselves, you're probably not going to be doing that for very long. Now, the silver bullet strategy suffers from the same issue. After the initial celebrity or influencer spreads the change to some percentage of their weak ties, those individuals will also find themselves socially isolated and without other people close to them to reinforce the new behavior. But this is if the celebrity even adopts the new norm in the first place. As Sintola says, a highly connected person is surrounded by far more countervailing influences than a regular person. Because all the influencers' contacts are following the established social norms, a highly connected person is unlikely to be incentivized to come out publicly against the status quo. This is why, according to Centola, the snowball strategy is, counterintuitively, the most effective for spreading social norms. As he says, with the snowball strategy, each of your change agents no longer faces a sea of countervailing influences. Instead, they are able to talk to one another about their decision, and they are able to share their experiences and reaffirm their mutual commitment. The snowball strategy doesn't just help the change agents to stick with the innovation, it also helps them to spread it. Because your change agents are all part of the same social cluster, they have social connections with the same non-adopters. This enables change agents to coordinate their efforts to increase the legitimacy and credibility among their mutual friends and shared neighbors. And as Centola highlights, this is exactly how many new norms from Twitter to new contraception methods to Facebook all actually managed to pick up steam from humble beginnings and eventually become the established social norm. And really what we tend to see is that when technology or new ideas, new political movements take hold, they tend to take hold out in the periphery instead of the center. And then when they spread, instead of jumping to the center, what they tend to do is they tend to spread around the edges of the social network. And they only reach the center of the network at the very end of the process. So now you've got a very deep scientific problem that actually means something for every industry that works in technology and behavior change, which is that our old model on the left, that things spread from the center outward, is in total contradiction with all of our best data on the right, which shows that new ideas, innovations tend to spread from the outside in. So if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you might be asking, well, how can we apply this to veganism or vegan organizations? Well, Aiden Kankyoku of Pax Fauna offers a few suggestions. The first is to target social groups, not just individuals. This could be things like friend groups, churches, sports teams, campus clubs, etc. The second is to concentrate efforts locally, target specific cities or neighborhoods, and then pour a disproportionate amount of resources into establishing them as strongholds for the social norm before branching out. And the third is to target social identities. Rather than targeting demographics like gender, age, or race, target markers of social connectedness, like lawyers, gamers, or people who say Barcelona. But is that all there is to the story? Well, not quite, because once we get the norm entrenched in one of these social clusters, it actually has to jump to other social clusters. And to encourage that, we need to form wide bridges rather than narrow ones. You can think of wide and narrow bridges like strong and weak ties, but applied to groups rather than individuals. A narrow bridge would look like this, essentially a point person that exists as a conduit between social clusters, while a wide bridge would look like this, with multiple individuals from one cluster being connected with multiple individuals from other clusters. Narrow bridges, like weak ties, are great at transferring information between groups, but as you can probably probably guess by now, not so great at spreading norms. Wide bridges, of course, are good at spreading social norms. So how do we apply this? Well, Ava Hamer, also of Pax Fauna, presents some interesting data regarding the social connectedness of some strategic US cities. The gist is that despite these cities being geographically distant, they show a high degree of social connectedness, at least as measured by Facebook. In other words, they're connected by relatively wide bridges. And so, the essential hypothesis is that efforts in changing norms in each of these cities would be mutually reinforcing. If a vegan in Boulder decides to join a protest, her influence makes it more likely that her friends in Berkeley and Asheville would decide to join a similar protest organized in their area. But there's like two whole articles on Pax Fauna covering that, so I'd encourage you to read those. But I actually think there's a much more local way to implement this. First, get on meetup.com or Facebook and join an in-person meetup group related to veganism or vegan activism. Then once you've established a network with strong ties in that group, start branching out to other meetup groups. You could do a plant-based cooking class or something totally unrelated like dodgeball or D&D. The key is to convince multiple members from the first vegan-focused group to join the non-vegan group, maybe by showing them this video. If only you join, you'll 
you'll have created a narrow bridge between the vegan and non-vegan group. But if multiple people from the vegan group join, you'll have created a wide bridge. Not to mention it's always easier going to a new meetup with at least one person you already know. Even without you explicitly advocating in the non-vegan group, the mere presence of multiple vegans is going to shift the Overton window. And that's going to increase the chances that the norm is adopted in that new group. But that's just one idea. I really want to explore this further. So if you've got any other suggestions on how vegans might implement this, drop them in the comments. And even if you don't, just say, hey, comments help my video and sometimes my mental health. And if you want to help me make this my full-time career, check out the Patreon in the description. And shout out to Ryan O'Neill, Tom Eisenbeis, Nutbase News, Monstar, David Yastrzemski, and Maxwell Edison.